I think we're going to have him hit that thing a little harder the next time. What do you guys think? <laughs> well, good afternoon uh, and welcome to the beautiful Indiana Supreme Court uh, courtroom. Uh, we thank you all for being here uh, today. Uh, and Chief Justice Rush, thank you for welcoming us uh, into your uh, uh, space today as your guest, as the Supreme Court's guest. Uh, so we're gathered here today to celebrate the legacy of Judge Patricia A. Riley uh, with all of you, her esteemed friends, family, which there's a lot of here today, and <laughs> colleagues. So as Chief Judge of the Court of Appeals, it is my honor to introduce our incredible judges uh, our senior judges and, and several of our retired judges who are here uh, from the Court of Appeals as well as the tax court. So I will get started on that. Uh, down here, let me make sure I've got my now. So we have the, uh, Judge Pete Foley from Morgan County, Judge Elizabeth Tafitis from Lake County, Judge Melissa May from Evansville, kinda. Uh, spent most of her life in Goshen, so. Uh, and then we have uh, on the bottom left over here, uh, Judge Nancy Vodic, former chief judge of our court. Um, in addition to that, looking out in the gallery, we have Judge Paul Mathias, seated next to Judge Terry Crone, who will be going through this ceremony in about a month or so. Uh, judge Cale Bradford, Judge Leanna Weissman, Judge Dana Kenworthy, our newest member of the Court of Appeals, Judge Paul Felix. We also have our senior judges here. We have uh, Judge John Baker, yep. Judge Ted Najem, and let's see, where is uh, Randy Shepard? Oh, the there he is. There. Good to see you, former Chief Justice Shepard. Uh, we also have some retired judges. Linda Cheesem. I've got her. I got, I got my list here, Pat. <laughs> I'm chief for a reason, all right? It's my day. <laughs> uh, we have Linda Cheesem, who is here, retired uh, judge. Uh, we also uh, have uh, former tax uh, court judge uh, Marty Wentworth. And we also have uh, former tax court uh, judge Tom Fisher with us. And of course, our new tax court judge, uh, Justin McAdam, uh, is here with us today as well. Um, we'd also like to recognize uh, a lot of our special uh, uh, guests who are here with us tonight. We do, uh, today we do have some state elected officials, uh, and never to be missed again, because I did one time, Diego Morales, our Secretary of State. Thank you, sir. Uh, Blake Lanning, Assistant Chief Deputy to the Indiana Attorney General. We also uh, have with us uh, the Honorable Michael Aylesworth, uh, as Representative of District 11 of uh, the Indiana House of Representatives. Uh, the Honorable Kendall Culp, Representative District 16 uh, of the Indiana House of Representatives. Uh, the Honorable Chris Jeter, uh, who is uh, District 88 <coughs> and is also chair of the House Judiciary Committee. Uh, we also have with us today the Honorable Jerry Tor. Uh, and where are you, Jerry? I just saw you at lunch. Uh, this will be uh, 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 Jerry is retiring in November uh, after three decades uh, uh, serving in the House. And uh, I ran into him in the hall this uh, week and said, are you going to be here? And he said, absolutely. He said, Pat Riley is my favorite judge. So uh, <laughs> state you. trial court judges are here. Uh, Russ Bailey mm -hmm. uh, from Jasper. Thank you, sir. Jasper uh, County. Yes, Jasper County. <laughs> yeah, I forget. Uh, we got a Jasper and we got a Jasper County. Uh, Heather Welch, uh, <clears throat> retired uh, judge from Marion County. Uh, Honorable John Rader, retired judge from Warren Circuit. We also have the Honorable Dale Arnett, judge of the Randolph Superior Court. Uh, we also have some people from our bar associations, and uh, Dean Karen Bravo, I believe, is here today. There you are. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, we have Joe Herons uh, here, uh, General Counsel for the Governor's Office. We'll hear from him in a little bit. Uh, Jerry Bonnett, General Counsel for Indiana Secretary of State uh, uh, Diego Morales. Uh, Jennifer Thuma, Chief Counsel for the Indiana State Comptroller. Where are you, Jennifer? There you are. Thank you for being here. Uh, Adrian Myring, uh, who is the Director of the Indiana Supreme Court Disciplinary Commission. Amy uh, Carrozos. Where are you, Amy? There, somewhere around here. Uh, State Public Defender's Office, Greg Packmeyer, who is the clerk of our appellate courts. Uh, Brad Skolnick, Executive Director of Indiana Office of Admissions and Continuing Education. Bob Rath, Chief Innovative Officer for the Indiana Office of Judicial Administration. Danny Lopez, I don't know if he's here. I saw him on television this morning, so. <laughs> um, 
Dave Duncan, President of the Indy uh, Bar Foundation. Uh, we also have John Maley, Vice President of the Indiana State Bar. Thank you, John. Always good to see you. Uh, Emily Gennon Hodson, uh, President of the Indiana Trial Lawyers Association. Thank you. Uh, and then we have Larry Morse, uh, our, um, our Court uh, of Appeals uh, Administrator. And I don't want to miss Tony Patterson here is on the Judicial Nominating Commission. Thank you. You're always kind to come to these, and we appreciate it. So thank you, Tony. Mm -hmm. uh, it's my pleasure at this time to turn the <coughs> mic over and introduce uh, Chief Justice Loretta Rush, and she's going to introduce members of uh, the Indiana Supreme Court who are with us today. Yeah, thank you, Chief Judge Altheis. Uh, the, I'd like to introduce Mark Massa, Christopher Gall, and Derek Moulter. Jeffrey Slaughter is at a conference out of state and sends his best. And on behalf of the Indiana Supreme Court, Judge Riley, thank you for your service. I've known you since you was a trial court judge. I appeared before you a trial court judge. You're a wonderful a court of appeals judge, um, very welcoming to new trial court judges. So thank you for all your service. You've really made a difference in the state of Indiana. Yeah. I'd also like to introduce some retired <coughs> Supreme Court justices. We have um, Randall Shepard and Frank Sullivan. I'm going to see you later at the McKinney School. All right. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Chief Justice Rush. Uh, so it's my opportunity at this time to introduce our speakers, and we have uh, a few. Uh, and we'll start off with Joe Herons, General Counsel for the Honorable Eric Holcomb, uh, Governor of Indiana. Thank you, Joe. Chief Justice Rush, Chief Judge Altais, Justices, Judges, and Honored Guests. It's my privilege to be here today on behalf of the Governor on this very special occasion. The judiciary in some ways is the most important branch of government. While its power and authority stem from the Constitution, the degree of that power depends in no small measure on its reputation, how it's perceived, and the respect people have for it. I've been an attorney here in Indiana for more than 35 years, and I have always paid particular attention during my career to our state appellate courts, including the Indiana Court of Appeals. And I am proud of our Court of Appeals over the years, which I consider one of the best appellate courts in our country, and many people hold that same belief. Judge Riley has been a part of and made important contributions to that success, that perception, during her 30 years on this court. At prior retirement ceremonies in this beautiful, magnificent courtroom, I have commented about how important appellate judges are and why that is, and how it's unfortunate that they rarely get the public recognition they deserve for their remarkable contributions to our state and the incredibly important role they play in our democracy. It's important that we properly recognize these public servants, and Judge Riley is one of those people. The governor is very selective about who he recognizes with the Sagamore of the Wabash Award. It's a high bar, and it's reserved for the very best among us who have made a remarkable contribution to our state. With her 30 years of service on this court, her many contributions over the years to the legal community, to the Indiana, Indianapolis, and Marion County Bar Associations, to civic associations and her service on boards, her leadership and advocacy about access to justice, an incredibly important issue in today's society, and her involvement with the International Judiciary Academy at The Hague Judge Riley has made a difference and distinguished herself. It is for all these reasons and many more that Governor Holcomb has decided to bestow our state's highest award, the Sagamore of the Wabash, upon Judge Riley. Judge, on behalf of the people, on behalf of the people of Indiana, the governor thanks you for your many years of service to your state and your contributions that you have made at so many levels. And he wants me to pass along his personal congratulations on a wonderful career. Thank you very much.
pretty cool. Wow, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Herons. Uh, the next person we're going to hear from is uh, Linda Pence, uh, a 1974 IU Robert H. McKinney School of Law graduate. Come on out, Linda. <laughs> thought I'd have a teleprompter. Don't you think we should have teleprompters <laughs> in this courtroom? Just for you, Linda. <laughs> you know, just, I wanted to, well, anyway. Uh, may it please this court and Judge Riley, honored guest, friends, family. 53 years ago, 1971, 1971, Pat Riley and I began law school together here in Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. When Judge Riley contacted me about an opportunity to speak before you today at her retirement party, I was overjoyed. And she explained to me her thought that she wanted to have three women, and we were going to talk about women's roles as lawyers. And she wanted me to talk about what it was like in law school and to be a woman student entering law school in 1971. And um, another woman, she wanted to have talk kind of about her present work and another one was gonna talk about some of the future. And when I got off the phone, the first thought to me was Pat Riley is writing and recreating Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol <laughs> And she had now uh, signed me the part of uh, the ghost of Christmas past. <laughs> but I soon recognized, um, quickly recognized how lovely that assigned task was because as I began thinking about it, wonderful memories came flooding back. Pat and I were baby boomers of, who came of age in the 1960s. We had the best music ever of any of you. It was the best of times. It was the age of Aquarius. We wore mini skirts, and I mean mini skirts. We would tell people that the skirt came to blow you know what, and then add an inch. <laughs> we marched. We marched in protest against the war in Vietnam, which was still raging. We marched for equal, equal rights. Our bodies and our minds were ours. No one had or still has the right to take those rights away. And we experienced great joy. The top single on the Billboard chart in 1971 was Joy to the World. As you may recall, Jeremiah was a bullfrog. <laughs> he was a good friend of mine. I never understood a single word he said, but I helped him a drink his wine. And he always had some mighty fine wine, singing joy to the world. All the boys and girls now, joy to the fishes in the deep blue sea, joy to you and me. How many of you have sang that to your children and grandchildren? <laughs> we, were, we were fearless. We were just fearless. Mm -hmm. No one was going to get in our way. Both of us faced critics who discouraged us from going to law school. We were told women just don't have what it takes. Mm -hmm. One man told me, that he knew the way, he knew a good trial lawyer by the way he walked. We knew they were nuts. <laughs> we also knew our history. And briefly, I want to remind you, our country's only been in existence for 248 years. 104 years ago, in 1920, the 19th Amendment was enacted, giving women the right to vote. Contrast that with the fact that it took 144 years to enact the 19th Amendment. 50% of our nation's women were not entitled to cast votes in many parts of the country for a long time. 
Women were jailed, abused, and mocked. This is wonderful. <laughs> and uh, mocked for demanding the most basic fundamental right. That's right. That's what I thought at the time. Some states continued to even block rights, especially to women of color. 1971, though, we were entering college. And I found a flyer from the Metropolitan Area Law, uh, Law Women in New York City in 1971 who were at Barnard College. And as many of you know, that's the major oldest college recognized for women that came out with a curriculum in New York where they could get the same education in the 1800s as men because NYU and Columbia and all those universities didn't allow women in. So they've been pillars and leaders in women's rights. So at this panel in, that was gonna take place on December 4th, they said, because we want to reach women who are ignored by traditional recruiting eff efforts, we are holding Women's Law Day. I'm going to just read straight from this because I want you to know I didn't make it up. <laughs> Contrary to what you may have heard, studying and practical and the practice of law need not be an alienating and elitist experience. We feel strongly that law has never been presented to women as a real possibility for their lives work. There is another alternative to being a full-time housewife and mother. Women should consider that legal work can be used to further the women's movement and at the same time further their personal goals and development as individuals. We have found from our experience that it really makes a difference that more and more women are in law school and ultimately practicing lawyers. Women as a group can humanize the law in legal institutions, but we cannot do it when we are only 3% of the nation's lawyers. We want all law schools to have at least 51% women as students, faculty, and as administrators. And then they encourage women to file applications in the law schools for NYU, Columbia, Brooklyn, Fordham, St. John's, Rutgers, and any other out-of-town law schools. Meanwhile, back in Indiana, Pat and I started law school. Pat recalls applying in 1971 but by August, she still hadn't heard from the law school as to whether she was going to gain entrance. So she stopped there and spoke with Dean Franson. He pulled her file and said they hadn't received her LSAT test yet. What was her score? She told him, and she vividly remembers this to this day. He said, oh, you're in. We haven't filled our quota. <laughs> now. Our 10 I don't yeah. want you, don't you dare, don't you dare say or even think that we were a diversity hire. We were as qualified and, more, and often more so than the men. Other qualified and clearly superior women had been refused admission for centuries. Quota was something that was earned. And we have fought and fought and earned that place to fill our law schools as they are now uh, at 50%. No one can really recall the actual numbers of women in our class, but it was around, we think, eight or 10. <laughs> it wasn't many. I can tell you there were only two toilets and there was never a line in the women's restroom. <laughs> there were no women mentors uh, to emulate. There were no women professors. We knew we had to make it on our own and we did. Pat, 
Pat has been a wonderful judge with great empathy and understanding for the plight of others. The law, she, as she sees it, is a place to improve all of our lives. She has made a difference. I've seen it firsthand. Now, she may be retiring from this bench, but I want all of you to know that in both of our minds, we are still wearing mini skirts. <laughs> we are still singing Janis Joplin, The Stones, <laughs> and Jeremiah was a bullfrog. That's right. <laughs> and we are still ready to attack anyone who gets in our way. <laughs> Thank you, Linda, very much. I knew that was going to be fun to listen to, and it absolutely was. Uh, next, we're going to hear from uh, Annika Calloway. She's a former law clerk for uh, Judge Riley and currently vice president of Equifax Privacy and Compliance Office. So take it away, Annika. 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 My bad. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Uh, 30 years. 30 years of leadership, brilliance, and laughter. Today, we gather to celebrate a woman who has been the heart and soul of this court for three decades, a visionary who transformed her chambers into a place of opportunity and growth for her law clerks, a mentor, a friend, and a champion for those often overlooked. I am proud to honor Judge Patricia A. Riley, whose infectious enthusiasm and unwavering belief in people have left an indelible mark on us all. Good afternoon. My name is Anika Calloway, and as the judge mentioned, I am a proud former law clerk of Judge Riley from 2002 to 2004. I'm currently the Vice President of Privacy and Compliance at Equifax in Atlanta, Georgia. When I think back on my, uh, my career and my first job after graduating from law school, uh, from Tulane University in New Orleans, Louisiana, I think how lucky was I to be able to start my legal career with Judge. I met Judge Riley in 2001 during my 3L year of law school while I was home for the holidays in Evansville. My interview was very memorable because my whole family braved a blizzard to drive me from Evansville to Indianapolis for the interview. The interview felt more like a conversation, more so than a formal meeting. She was authentically interested in me as a person, a potential lawyer, and someone who'd be sharing a very close workspace with her for many hours. <laughs> Our conversation flowed between vastly different worlds, from my experience at an HBCU as a Spelman student, to my law school experience advocating for incarcerated clients, to the glaring lack of diversity in the legal field, especially for women of color. Unexpectedly, she expressed a desire to meet my entire family, my mom, dad, and brother, who made the long drive to deliver me to the interview. Now, little did I know that that was the key to me landing the job. <laughs> but it didn't stop there. Her interest in me continued to expand beyond the professional realm, encompassing my family, my friends, and my cultural background. In a world that's often defined by limitations, she saw possibilities. In a society where conformity was the norm, she celebrated individuality. She challenged stereotypes by actively questioning and refuting biases and built inclusive teams by prioritizing diversity in hiring and team composition. Her influence extended beyond her chambers. She was a driving force in creating a more inclusive legal profession by inspiring other law firms to follow suit. I have a very clear memory of Judge going above and beyond to help me find a job by reaching out to area law firms to recommend me as a strong candidate. 
Now, beyond this brilliant powerhouse in the courtroom who tirelessly champions diversity and inclusion, Judge, as you all know, is extremely kind and possesses a unique sense of humor. <laughs> and the usually quiet Capitol building, her laughter <laughs> is contagious and echoes loudly. <laughs> and let us not forget her impeccable style. Picture this, Judge rolling up in her red convertible drop top Mercedes Benz, <laughs> looking like a million bucks. The highlight of my summer, the highlight of my time working for her was undoubtedly our extended Friday lunches during the summer. Now, I believe it's safe to say that the details of our Friday summer lunches which may or may not have included wine, our best <laughs> left 22 years ago. <laughs> Thank you. Judge, you have... <laughs> <laughs> Judge, you have not only been a great leader, but also a wonderful mentor and friend. Your wisdom and support have shaped the careers of countless law clerks, especially mine. Mentoring is often about offering knowledge, empathy, and guidance. Judge, you've provided all three in abundance. My steps are sure. My cadence can be depended upon. And my arrival is certain because you made that path clear. So as one chapter in your life closes, Another filled with joy, longevity, and continued impact begins. I celebrate you and your immense contributions and congratulations. Thank you, Thank you Anika. Our last speaker, final speaker, is our colleague, uh, Dana Kenworthy, Indiana Court of Appeals. May it please the court. Judge Riley asked me to speak a few words today about the development of women in the, in the legal profession, but to do that, I need to share a little bit about the past. Since Indiana became a state in 1816, 14 women have served on the appellate benches, two on the Supreme Court, one on the tax court, who's here today, and 11 on the Court of Appeals. Half of us are serving now, and all of us are still alive. Yeah. Bessie Eaglesfield was the first woman admitted to a county bar in 1875, and Antoinette Dakin Leach was the first admitted by the Indiana Supreme Court in 1909. Indiana was the eighth state in admitting female attorneys, but was the 38th state <laughs> to allow a woman to sit as a judge. In 1919, Ella Groninger served as a special judge in a Marion County divorce case. But it wasn't until 1965 when Sue Shields became the first woman elected to the trial bench. All states finally had a woman serving on the bench for the first time in, get this, 1980. <laughs> Chief Justice Rush says, to be the robe, you have to see the robe. <laughs> So what motivated our trailblazers to be among the first? While preparing these remarks, I've been trying to answer that question. To that end, I've been listening to this podcast called Wiser Than Me with Julia Louis-Dreyfus. Mm. Julia interviews and gathers wisdom from older ladies. And in one of these interviews, author Isabel Allende described how she is part of the transition generation between her mother's values and the new wave of young feminists working to change the world. She described her generation and that of Judge Riley as raised by our mothers, but act like our daughters. Mm -hmm. And oddly enough, as I was driving down the road listening to that particular episode, I looked up and noticed the SUV in front of me had a bumper sticker that said, mom rules the world, and a license plate surround with Betty Boop that said, Hot Mama. <laughs> Can you imagine that in 1949 no. when Judge Riley was born? 
Hmm. Former trial court and court of appeals judge Betty Bartow mm -hmm. wrote a law review article in 1997 about the experience of early women judges. Judge Bartow surveyed all women who had served to judges as judges up to that point. They commonly reported that they had no support network urging them to become candidates, nor did they have a network to support them after they took the bench. Each woman felt unique and isolated. Several indicated their appearance was commented upon frequently, and they were referred to by their first name, or sir, or even honey. <laughs> Often, they were told they were too young or that they didn't look like judges. If you look around this room at these portraits, you'll see for the first 150 years of our state's history, that last part was true. Between 1950 and 1970, only 3% of Indiana lawyers were women. Judge Riley graduated from law school in 1974, and I looked at your picture, your class picture, Judge Riley, and counted the women, one of 10 in her class. That was about 9% of the class. But in her home community, Rensselaer in rural Jasper County, she was told there was no room for women in the legal profession. Now, knowing Judge Riley as I know her now, I would have liked to have been there for that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> she proved that person wrong in 1990 when she was appointed and became the first female judge in Jasper County. She knew then she had to stand for election in a county that was largely made up of the opposing political party. So she fell back upon her education in political science and studied the voter registration rules. And what she noted was that there were a lot of, her words, little old ladies <laughs> who voted. And so in the two years leading up to that election, she sent each one of those little old ladies a birthday card. <laughs> she found her own way, did, her, did things her own way, and she succeeded. In 1994, she became the first woman appointed, excuse me, the fourth woman appointed to the Court of Appeals. And at that time, about 16% of attorneys and 12% of judges were women, but nearly 39% of law grads were. Yeah. Today, about 36% of active Indiana attorneys are women, 40% of judges, and 55% of law grads are women. Judge Riley has now been an attorney for half a century, and she served full-time on the Court of Appeals for 30 years. Only two prior judges have been here longer than she has, Judge Patrick Sullivan with 38 years and Judge John Baker, who's here today with us at 31. So how did the trailblazers do it? I suspect many did it just like Judge Riley did, and that was their own way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Judge Riley's path reflects resilience, courage, and thinking outside the box. She is unapologetically her own person. She is colorful and she is funny. She is not afraid to express an unpopular opinion or advocate for issues important to her. One case in point. In around 2008, and thank you to Robert Kariyuki for, for sharing this story, Judge Riley traveled to Nairobi, Kenya as part of an Indianapolis Rotary delegation. In addition to their Rotary projects, the group explored local tourist attractions. One morning, they were scheduled to visit a refuge for orphan ele elephants. But Judge Riley learned that in their hotel, there was a conference of Kenyan judges taking place. Intrigued, she said, I don't want to see the elephants. I'm going to crash this conference of Kenyan judges. And that's what she did. And there she discovered the severe injustices faced by women and children affected by HIV and AIDS in the pandemic in rural Kenya. Things such as disinheritance, gender-based violence, and defamation, among other issues. That experience led Judge Riley to co-found the Legal Aid Clinic of Eldoret in Kenya, short uh, lace for short. She leveraged her connections here in Indianapolis, worked with judges and lawyers in Kenya, and started that clinic that has since served thousands of victims in Eldoret, Kenya. So lace was created because Judge Riley crashed a Kenyan judicial <laughs> conference. <laughs> 
Judge Riley's work with LACE and her visits to El Duret have left a profound impact not only on those she's helped, but also on her. She earned the endearing nickname of Gogo, which means, uh, which is grandmother in the Kalenjin language. Mm -hmm. To this day, her grandchildren lovingly call her Gogo because she is always on the go. <laughs> Now, a few weeks ago, Judge Riley and I attended an indie opera event to support our communications director, Ann Fuchs, who's a very talented opera singer and performs frequently with the indie opera. Pat and I were chatting at a little round table during the cocktail hour. A couple of uh, pairs of folks sidled up to our table, and one of the gentlemen says to us, where do, you, where do you ladies work? And Pat says, the Court of Appeals. And one of the gentlemen, I would say 40-ish in age, said, oh, do you ladies handle all the papers? <laughs> wow. <laughs> now, do people really think we still handle piles of paper at the Court of Appeals? <laughs> um, we apparently, Judge Riley, still have work to do. Our system is still evolving, <laughs> and we still have a lot of room for improvement, not just in gender diversity, because the justice system is simply more credible when judges and advocates are from diverse backgrounds. Judge Riley, on behalf of myself and other women who have come after you, I thank you for your half century of service, for being part of that transition generation, widening the path for those of us who follow. You've ensured that I do not feel isolated. Look at all of my sisters on the bench. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. I wish you all the best as you go, go into retirement. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Kenworthy. Uh, normally, uh, in these ceremonies, we always present our retiring judge with a gift. Um, but Pat has requested, and we have made, uh, a donation instead of giving her a gift uh, on the occasion of her retirement uh, to Recycle Force. And Greg Kiesling is here today, and I'm sure we'll hear in Pat's remarks a little bit more about him. So mm -hmm. there you go, Greg. You're welcome. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. So it's my opportunity to give some brief remarks now as, as well. And as you've just heard from uh, the men and the women that have, have spoke about Judge Riley, uh, she is a force of nature and a force to be reckoned with. <laughs> Those of you who know her well know this to be true. Her passion for social issues inside and out of the courtroom has always been palpable to her colleagues. She is fearless and unafraid to take a stand, even if the opinion is unpopular. She speaks her truth and advocates no matter how difficult that path may be. And her path was difficult. She, as we've heard today, was the fourth woman ever to be appointed to the Court of Appeals and only one of a handful of women practicing law when she first entered the, the profession. She learned early on, very early on, to be tough. And the toughness served her very well for over 30 years on the Court of Appeals where she helped to shape the future of law for generations to come. She has uh, trailblazed a path where women could see themselves in positions of power, and she has always found a way to show that she show empathy uh, for the forgotten, as we have heard, and those that society could easily just set aside. She believes in second chances, working with Recycle Force, wants to create uh, opportunities for formerly incarcerated individuals and give them a chance to give back to society and make a broader community impact. And she believes, as we've also heard, in opportunities for other forgotten communities. Her work in Kenya, uh, helping HIV AIDS patients, Judge Kenworthy spoke about, her visits to international courts, uh, which no one has talked about, but in the Netherlands, Sierra Leone, Yugoslavia, and even Guantanamo Bay. You could say that she's always had a place in her heart for the underdog, um, but maybe it's that she can find things to leave, to love, excuse me, about people, uh, even in their darkest uh, moments. And that's not an easy thing to do, as we all know, to look at an overlooked, uh, to remember the forgotten, to see all uh, the humanity in all of us, uh, even when times are dark and poor, ch or poor choices are made. Where others may be more comfortable turning a blind eye, Pat Riley has had the courage to face some of society's most uncomfortable issues. And so it is bittersweet today that we say goodbye to this fearless judge, courageous leader, and a champion of the forgotten. But Pat, rest assured, we cannot and we will not forget you. Yeah, I bet. <laughs>
So at my, it, it's this, uh, at this time, it's my opportunity to turn the right mic over to uh, Judge Patricia, the Honorable Patricia Riley, and uh, to make her farewell remarks. Thank you, Bob. That was so nice. Thank you. <laughs> I'd just like to add, first of all, that when uh, Dana and I were at the opera uh, gathering, that she was the one that immediately corrected the man to say, no, we're judges. <laughs> and I thank you for that. <laughs> uh, I don't know how I'm going to talk about 50 years a lawyer in October. Can you believe that, Linda? 50 years. And Greg, I see Greg. Greg was in our class, Han. It was 50 years, and in 10 minutes, I'm not going to get through it, but you've heard some of the highlights, I think, in some, with some of my friends. You, you, you never ask somebody to speak that isn't really your friend. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's been nice. But first of all, I, I just, you've heard a little bit about where I'm from, and I don't, you know, we, none of us can ever forget where we're from when we think about uh, how, how we've managed these 50 years. But I stand before you a 1967 graduate of Rensselaer High School. And it was, you know, it's a small town, 5,000 people. And I, we have our representative here, uh, Mr. Culp. So nice of you to come, Kendall Culp. And his father was the Republican County Chairman. And I don't think he was too happy I wanted to be judge in Jasper County. <laughs> So small towns, they just keep going. And, and that's where, you know, I got my backbone, I'm sure, was in that small town. Um, I, I was going to be a, a, a judge since, I think, third or fourth grade because we were learning about Thomas Jefferson and the Declaration of Independence and all this. And, and I was going to be Thomas Jefferson. I was going to be uh, the country gentleman and live on a farm and tell people what to do and have a garden and, you know, invent things. That, that was my goal. It never occurred to me that it wasn't a woman, and I'd never known a woman to do that. It was just that's what I was going to do. Um, so I think I got pretty close to it, uh, uh, just being and doing those things on my own that I thought were important. Um, there was... Uh, the, uh, Linda mentioned this, I think it was Linda, that there was an attorney in town at the time who told me that there's no place for women in the practice of law. If you want a woman to do something, just tell her what she can't do, you know? So that's what happened. You know, I'll show him, and I'm a, I am was made sure I went to law school. And my dad was always my biggest supporter. He, he was... He was in uh, he was the greatest generation, and he was a World War II veteran, was in the 10th Mountain Division. And uh, right out of law school, he went to, uh, he was, uh, he went into, he volunteered, and he was in the 10th Mountain Division. And they went to, which is now Vail, they developed Vail after the war, and learned to ski. And his, his job was supposed to be to go to Italy in the Alps, and uh, patrol the Alps during World War II. But by the time they were all trained, he, uh, 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 they sent him to Italy because that's where the Germans were and they were driving the Germans out of Italy. And that's what he did. And he, he got a Purple Heart. He was blown up on, a, on the wheel of a tank and uh, uh, got GI benefits. And uh, I was so fortunate about, what, five, six years ago, I went to Italy, and I followed his, the path of the 10th Mountain Division. I went with the descendants of the 10th Mountain. It was just amazing to think of the stories, that, places that he had talked about, and to see him in person, where they chased him over the mountains and into the rivers, and it was an amazing experience. And that's what builds our character as well. And he was, uh, he was so proud. I, I worked all through college and law school. I went to law school at night. Um, money was tight. And it, and it was the best experience that could have happened to me was to have to work my way through. But he was so proud because we have discovered then that as a GI Bill, he was entitled to $24 an hour for his family. And believe it or not, that's what law school was at that time, $24 an hour. It's just hard to believe. And I, I'm just 
so sad the fact that everything in education is so high and that people can't work to get through school. But he was so proud of him being able then to afford my law school education. So those, those sorts of things is what grows, to me, is what grows you uh, with that backbone because you have these examples in front of you of, of people. And the teachers were wonderful. They never told me I couldn't do anything. And, and it was, so, you know, when we talk about mentors, is so important, and we've we discovered that at, Re at Recycle. We have wonderful mentors at Recycle who've been through the program and now have turned their life around, and they mentor others who come into the program. But women starting out didn't have any mentors, and that's, I, I think, is the biggest thing that we missed. I, when I was in high school or whenever, we, we couldn't, we didn't have any sports. And I always thought that was such a shame because, you know, in the sports field is where a lot of men would would form uh, strong bonds of friendship and trust. And women in my age didn't have that uh, experience. So mentoring is so, so, so important. And I think we throw that word around too much. And instead of getting to the meat and how important that is. And so I, I wanna thank uh, everyone for the remarks to say that I was a good mentor because that, that's what counts, is when I, when I was a trial court judge in Jasper County for four years, that's what I, I would uh, tell, uh, ask all the teachers to bring their kids to, to class to see the courtroom. And that was why I wanted them to do that, so the, the little girls could see me on that bench. And I've, I've read often where uh, girls really change between fourth and fifth grade about that time. And so it, it's, if they, have that impression, and that's why my, uh, I wanted my granddaughter here, she's only four, but she'll remember parts of this. But I wanted her to see all these women in robes and to know that we're sitting up here on the bench and that we're strong people. And my grandsons already know how strong I am. So, <laughs> so they're good, they, they can see it for themselves. So that, that's where I came from. And I ran for judge in, in Jasper County uh, in 1988 for circuit court judge, and I lost. And I, I went door to door uh, in this Republican County for months, and I got like 300 more votes than my other Democrat <laughs> candidates. So uh, there was just no way to, to get through that veil. Um, and so Kendall will remember this or hear stories of this is that, um, the county chairman, which was his dad, and the county representative uh, legislature were sort of in a spat. And so they decided to go to the Democrat legislator and say, well, we need another court and we want Pat to be there as judge because I was the only Democrat in town. <laughs> so uh, I had my own courtroom then. It was a new Superior Court number two and, and they had, uh, they wouldn't particularly, they didn't want me in the courthouse. So they put me in the old REMC building, which was just fine. <laughs> we did well. Uh, so that was an experience. Then that's when I wrote the birthday cards because I thought, well, you know, if they hear from the little old Republican ladies, and I grew up Republican. My dad was a Republican legislator. So that's about all you could be in Jasper County. But the, I still, so that's because I had to run the next general election in 92. And so um, when I got ready to run, none of the men, nobody filed against me. And I always thought it was because the men were afraid that they'd lose to a Democrat woman <laughs> and they couldn't have held their head up. <laughs> so then in 94, I was appointed to the Court of Appeals and, it's been a wonderful experience. Uh, I, 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 today, I don't, I'm scattered, and, and my dog ate some of my notes. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's a wonderful t opportunity for me to speak from the heart. And, and uh, the love that I feel in this room is, I, I look around and there's a story with each one of you and I just, uh, uh, which leads me to say, tell you that I knew it would be a rush sort of situation and after this, we have a, a, a the court puts on a, an, 
uh, hors d'oeuvres and, and um, drinks, or, or like lemonade, uh, for a while. <laughs> well, I'm going to buy you all a drink, okay? <laughs> I have reserved a place over at Lock Miller's, which is just across the street, uh, Washington Street, and I've got a room and I'm really gonna buy you a drink. I am just so happy that you're all here. And I look back there, I've gotta talk to my clerks. I have some back there that have come from Pennsylvania. Uh, Tim, I didn't even get, I was afraid I would never get a hold of you. That's great, he's here. And, and Nika from Atlanta, it's just an amazing thing. And, oh, I got Claire, I can't forget Claire from, you're in, you're in North Carolina now? South, North Carolina. Yeah, and her mom, Sylvia, is with us. And Sylvia was Baker's uh, uh, secretary for ages. I just love it. Um, and then my son and his wonderful children are, uh, who are out because they cry and run around the halls. <laughs> They're from Florida. And where else have we got? Uh, I thought we had, a, oh, uh, I see Judge uh, Russell, Russell Bailey, that's it. I couldn't think, he took Judge McGraw's spot as a judge in Jasper County. He came clear from Rensselaer, so we're just, oh, and Lake County's in the house. <laughs> Can't forget Lake County. Oh, yeah, I love my Lake County friends, yes. So we'll have some time to talk later. But I want just a few more remarks. Um, let's see. <laughs> what did I write? That part's the best. This part's the best. Okay. <laughs> um, oh, I wanted. I know, I, I'm not going to get out of my back. My Rensselaer to any other remarks. It seems, but um, Rensselaer is the home of judges. You all must know that by now. Um, we had uh, uh, Judge Leopold for years. I started to write a book about his family. Uh, they were from Russia re originally and uh, ended up settling in Rensselaer and op opened a store. And they were Russian Jews uh, running from uh, the discrimination in Russia. And this would have been in the 1850s, 1840s. And they w were a very big part of, of of our town and, and its development. And uh, Judge Leopold sat, I don't know, 30, 40 years, a long time. And then it was Judge Caney, Mike Caney in Seventh Circuit. Um, who else? Uh, Fisher, where's Fisher? Tom Fisher there, my buddy Tom. He was uh, the prosecuting attorney when I was a public defender in Rensselaer. <laughs> We had a few little spats, and I love him dearly. Yeah, <laughs> so glad he's here. And then Jamie uh, Ayler. Ayler came from Rensselaer, so we're we're a pretty hot spot. If all you young lawyers want to be a judge, go live in Rensselaer. Okay? <laughs> yeah, uh, I I think you've heard about some of my international travel. I think what happened at that point in in my life was. When I got to Kenya, it was such a wonderful experience. And I went with uh, Rotary the first time. I went with the Rotary Club. And uh, IU has this wonderful partnership with the uh, Eldoret Teaching Hospital at the time. And uh, Dr. Mamlin was there, and he was a pioneer in trying to curb AIDS in Kenya. And he worked with Lilly and some of the, the other drug companies, and he got uh, the medicine that was able to, to curb some of the growth of AIDS. Oh, and Diego was there, weren't you? De Diego came over and, and visited. Yeah, it was wonderful. So, doctor, they had exchange programs with the, the uh, medical students from Kenya and IU. And I said, well, that's great to Dr. Mamlin. I said, well, what can lawyers do? And he said, I don't know. Why don't you go ask him? And so that's what I did. The, the Rotary I was with, they set up a, a, a tea for me and, the, and some of the lawyers in Fran. Did Fran make it? Okay. And Fran Quigley. Um, and we, we met and they, I, we said, what do you want? Because that was Teresa Willard. Just Teresa. Teresa, hi. Teresa, my clerk, her brother was, in, was one of the founders of this program in Kenya. And I went to talk to uh, his, her brother, Dr. Einters, 
And uh, I said, well, when I go to Kenya, what should I expect? What should I look for? And he said, he said I, you, what you've got to do is you've got to ask them what they want. And I've read so many books about nonprofits and all, and, and they d just always tell you, uh, you know, you don't go in with, with symbols banging saying, here's what we're going to do for you. You know, and so that was such a valuable lesson, and I think that is what led to a lot of my travel, was meeting the people and saying, what is it you want? What could I do for you? Tell me about your life. And that's the only way in my, in my experience is, is to uh, gather knowledge and gather wisdom, and it's so enjoyable. Uh, so we started the legal clinic, and it's still going strong. I think they have six or seven lawyers. So I, I'm going back in Christmas Day to, to Kenya, and we're going to see the clinic. But I'm really going back because Robert and Kate are getting a traditional wedding in Kenya. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> After two children. <laughs> and that's a wonderful story because Robert is our IT director, and he's just one of the best in the country. And he... Uh, as a friend, my friend Carol is his sister, and so I met Robert in Kenya through Carol and, uh, and Rotary then, and we were trying to get him a scholarship to go come here to get an informatics degree. And uh, the, it fell through at Purdue, and so I called, I think most of you know, Pat Shoulders, who's a trustee at IU, and I said, I bet you've never had an African graduate from your informatics program. So he got a scholarship, and, and now he works for us. He's our IT director all these years, and he's wonderful, wonderful. And he met his beautiful wife, Kate, uh, who's from Kenya, who is a lawyer in Kenya, and at a party at what, Michigan? Oh, the party was here, but you were at Michigan going to school and getting her LLM. That's it. And uh, she's been my clerk for years. So these, you know, connections that you make when you open your heart and you open your mind to these experiences is uh, lifelong, and it's the circle of life. That's, uh, that's for sure. And I, but I just wanted to say about that, and I, I, I'm going to quit because I don't like long speeches. <laughs> and um, there's cake out there, and too. And there's cake. And then there's a drink. Don't forget Lockmiller's. <laughs> the, um, the only thing I think going forward, and I tried to do, I mean, Linda's right. She was Christmas past. <laughs> if I have to go down, you do, too. <laughs> And Anika was just trying to tell us about her experiences and what was going on in the, and when she was here. And then Dana's our, our future and uh, how the court's going forward. But what bother, the only thing that really bothers me, I'm really thrilled about all the things going on, but I'm, I worry that you know, pretty soon we're going to know everything because it's going to be on the, the Internet or it's going to be... Somebody's going to research it. There'll be all these sorts of things going on, and we're just going to know everything. But by doing that, we're not going to experience anything. And that, to me, is, is the joy of life, are those experiences, you know, to try and open your heart and your mind to the world, not just Indiana, which is a good place, and you can start there, but just to... Uh, uh, your curiosity, keep it moving, keep it moving around the world, and uh, yeah, we'll get it straight one of these days, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Judge Riley. Well, that concludes uh, our ceremony. Um, normally, we have a reception right outside of these doors. Uh, we have moved that reception to the fourth floor, and we're going to have our Court of Appeals receptions up there. It's where our offices are located, and we've got a lot more room up there. So, bailiff, if you will bang us out.
recorded.